Hey, welcome to our YouTube page. We're so excited to be with you today. We hope this message encourages you and inspires you. But if you miss Sunday, don't worry about it. You can go to the link below in our description, click the link and enjoy the full service experience. And we will see you next time online. So good to have you with us today. Give us a shout. So good to have you. And uh, hey, we're excited about what God's doing. Aren't you glad it's summer? Oh, that wasn't too short. Come on, for those of you who are happy at summer, give me a shout. Are you happy at summer? And uh, if you're online, uh, I'm happy at summer for you too. Just give me a show of, of a wave of hands today. How many of you just love winter? Give me a, sh- give me a wave. Some hands, some people that need prayer. Um, that's great. If you're online and you uh, like winter, just let us know on the WhatsApp line. Let us know in the comments. Say, I like winter because we need to help you. Uh, we, we desperately need to. Hey, so this is, a, this is a church, but we are also in a studio, and it's kind of weird, isn't it? And we look at kind of how church has changed. Uh, you know, prior to, prior to uh, lockdown, if someone said to me there would not be people in front of me but cameras, I would have gone, you've lost your marbles. Why would I be talking to a camera? Although the camera people are quite cute. We've got Cameron. Cameron, just move the, move the dolly around. It'll be go. I don't know whether I'm live on the dolly, but someone is. There we go. I'm live on the dolly. Cameron's nodding. Um, there we go. Then there's someone. I don't know who it is. Is that Matt? Matt's kind of halfway up. He's, he's kind of short enough to be halfway up, but not quite tall enough to be at the back. And then there's, there's who's right at the back? Jenna. Jenna's right at the back. So, so we've, got a full, we've got a fully fledged new South African camera team. Cameron... An Indian, we have got Matt, short, and Jenna, a lady. It's perfect. We're all sorted. We're properly BEE compliant. There we go. That's good. Too soon to be talking about back back economic empowerment. Uh, If you're offended, get over it. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be having fun today. And the whole purpose of today is to connect with you, have fun. We're going to to get into God's Word. And if you're watching online and you're here for the first time, oh my greatness, let us know. 082-736-9668. That'll help us to connect with you. If you're in the auditorium, what's really cool about that little QR code, so so just excuse me for a moment, all of you online, you've got a WhatsApp line. That's what we can give you. But for everyone in in the room, you've got a QR code. It tells you everything you need to know. If you want to connect with us, if you want to get involved in something, scan it, follow the menu system, it'll take you along the way, and we, we are so excited about that. But we need to get to the message, and, and I'm really excited about this series because, hey, let's be honest, we live in a broken world, right? Uh, and I'm pretty sure that no matter where you are, no matter where you have been over the last couple of months, uh, even if you're uh, new, to, new to the online church, if you first to, if you're new, new to our church at all, you will look around and you can see everywhere you look, there's heartache and pain. Uh, we, we see this with racial tension across the globe today. We see this particularly in our own country. We see there's difficulty in businesses. Certain industries are, are, are taking huge strain. Businesses are closing. Entrepreneurs are struggling. Uh, there are other entrepreneurs that are thriving. It depends on the industry. But we're seeing the environment particularly under pressure. Here's the problem. We tend to look for answers in the wrong places. Because we all know we need answers. All, each and every one of us needs to get some kind of input. We're all looking for uh, the mystery solution to some of the problems we're facing. But the, the reality is if we look at the wrong place, we're going to get wrong answers. If we get wrong answers, we're going to apply those wrong answers. And by applying those wrong answers, we create more hurt and pain. Here's a statement that I, I heard many years ago I was, as I was growing up under a, a, my, my ministry leadership at the time. Uh, my pastor said this, you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And I wonder today whether we're part of the problem or part of the solution. And, and as followers of Christ, oh my word, we need to be particularly careful that we're adding value, not adding pain. And I think that's really what this series is about. I do want to encourage you to watch uh, online, get, get involved, get, get connected with all of the services, come to church if you can. Book your butt. That's what we say in our church. It's not politically correct. We don't care. Book your butt. Get your seat booked, get, come and join us if you can make it. And, uh, and the whole purpose of this particular series is to help us find the right solutions. Now, where do you look? Well, I mentioned this last week and the week before and the week before that. Here's what's really important. You need to look in the right place. We believe as followers of Christ, we believe something bizarre, really. Like, so you might be watching and go, what do Christians believe? Well, we believe that God wrote a book. 
But he didn't write it with his own hand. He breathed into humanity and human beings filled with flaws and difficulties and all sorts of issues, uh, received inspiration by God to write down the Word of God. That's what we believe. That's the Bible. And, and the Bible brings solutions. We believe it's the foremost authority on pretty much anything that we face. Now, that's really exciting because the Word of God is the answer. Now, you might be watching today. You might even be in the room today going, well, I don't believe in Jesus. Well, that's okay. You might go, I don't believe in God. So I don't believe that the Bible is God breathed. Well, that's okay. If you're looking for answers, you can still look at the Bible. Why? Because it's life's user manual. Now, for clarity, you might go, well, that's flawed thinking. No, it isn't, because I'm pretty sure that for every single one of us in this room, everyone online, you have bought a product at some point. Uh, let's say that you bought yourself uh, a Toyota, and you wanted to know where the fuse box was. Maybe you don't know that. So you, you take out your Toyota user manual, and you find where the fuse box is. Now, here's the thing. Do you know personally the person who wrote the Toyota user manual? but you still believe the manual. Now that person, you don't know whether that person can even write properly. You don't know whether they're even true. You still have to go and find the fuse box. Now what happens if it's not there? Well, that's because if you buy a product from China, you might find that that's what happens. That the, now listen, we've all seen that, right? <laughs> have you ever read a manual that's been directly translated from Mandarin into English? It doesn't make any sense, but we believe it. So is it not easy to believe the Word of God, the Bible, as a user manual for life? At the very least... At the very least, it's a very good manual for life. So let's get into the Word of God. Let's read the Bible. And uh, you'll find solutions for your marriage, for your business, for raising money, for saving money, for, for health issues, for eating correctly. Oh, my word, there is so much wealth in that user manual. Why don't you spend time reading the user manual for life? In fact, one of the great leaders in history, a guy called Paul, he wrote this when he was writing to the developing church in Ephesus. He said this in Ephesians 4 verse 3. He said, make every effort. Say it with me. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Why? Because uh, Paul knew through inspiration from God that humanity isn't particularly excited about building unity. In fact, it's an unnatural response. We typically cause more disunity than we cause unity. We, we are seldom uplifting. We are more often uh, critical. And we, that's kind of the human form, the, the human nature. So we need to recognize beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have to make every effort to build unity. And if you and I can build unity, oh my word, how, how amazing will that be? We will start to see things change. Now listen, you don't, when you're standing at, at the altar with your spouse, your, your fiance, you're about to get married and you're looking at each other in the eyes and, and you're completely overwhelmed with, uh, with love for that person, you in that moment don't ever think about the difficulties you're about to have. But it's not long, if you're married, it's not long before you end up recognizing that there's going to be a Barney. That's a South African word for a fight. You're going to have a, you're going to have a bit of a roll, another South African word. You're going to have a tussle. That's another South African word. You see, we fight a lot. Uh, so no, I'm teasing. Ray. So there's, there's these different words. We, we can get into this world where we go, I, 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 I look at my wife. I cannot believe I married her. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm too scared to. But you get to that point. Like, like, I'm married. I'm married. But like, did I make the right decision? Come on. Every single one of us, and you're online, listen, online, you've just asked that question right now while staring at him. <laughs> at some point, we get to wonder, what, you know, what on earth? You know, why, why was he such a nice guy when he dropped onto his one knee? Now I'm removing his jocks off the fan. He's always got his socks tucked under the cushions in, in, our, in, in, our, in our lounge. Like, we get stuck, like, how can you do that? But here's the reality, you don't quit on them. You've got to make every effort to try and encourage them kindly to change their behavior pattern. But some of those patterns aren't going to change. So we make every effort. That's called commitment. The reason we struggle with unity is because we so often think that unity is all about agreement. It isn't. It's mostly about commitment. And when we can get that correct, everything changes. That's why this series is called, a series is called Discovering the Power of Unity. When you and I can understand the power of unity, everything can change. If you've missed any of the series so far, pop onto our YouTube channel. The details will come up online. You can find that right now. Watch, like, and share. Subscribe. Hit that little bell icon. All of that helps us to get content to you, and it'll help you to keep on track. So watch all of those. It'll be of great value. Now, we're going to carry on today with part four. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you today, most of all, for loving us. Thank you for bearing with us. Thank you for allowing us to find ourselves amidst such difficult circumstances. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your care. 
Lord, I ask today that you'll touch each and every one of us in this room, across the channels watching, that you'll guide us, help us to see what you need us to see so that we can be more effective. Shape what we need shaped, shaped so that we can be more effective. Father, I ask today that your hand will be on us and that in every way you will guide us forward. In Jesus' name. And it was it. Amen. Amen. So as we go to part four, here's a thought. Have you encountered children? Have you encountered? Listen, I love kids. I, 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 am, I am a big kid. I, I love hanging out with small kids, big kids, large kids, teenage kids, tweens, the whole trip. I love it. I, I don't want any more of my own. But I, I do love them. I, I love your kids best because I can give them back. But I, I do love them. I love, I love hanging with teenagers. Now, for some of you who have got teenagers, you're going, I'm not sure I love hanging with my own teenager. That's because they're yours. You, you, you'll, you'll find that, that you'll hang out better with other people's teenagers. It's kind of weird. Like, your teenagers love you, so they give you a hard time. No logic, no logic, but that's how it works. So you'll find that all sorts of people are difficult. Now, here's what's interesting. The younger the children are, Obviously, this is profound. You came to watch online for this profound piece of information that the younger they are, the more immature they are, right? Now, now we know this. Now, what I love about kids, particularly small ones that have just learned to speak, is that they have no filter. <laughs> have you noticed that about your kids? Yeah. They have no filter. Now, so now, in other words, if, if a small child has just learned to speak, thinks you're fat, they have no problem telling you. If they think you've got a weird hairstyle, they'll tell you. In fact, what's even more embarrassing is that you've got small kids and they think someone else is fat, they say it loud. <laughs> Have you ever been in a shopping mall or in a restaurant or something with a small kid and they go, Mommy, why is that guy so fat? And you're like, Ugh! and it's like horrifying, isn't it? And, and then they go, you go like, what, what do you think? Oh, no, Mommy, that's really ugly. Or, Mommy, why is that guy walking funny? Dad, 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 your tummy's big, eh? And you have these conversations with kids. And, and we look at those kids, and we're completely comfortable with that. But we, we sometimes find that a little, a little sting, but we don't get overly perturbed by it. Why? Because we expect small children to be immature. Now, obviously, those kids grow up. The question we've got to ask ourselves is, do they stay immature? Because if you had a 16-year-old who has no filter, and that walks into your house, and you've got guests with you, perhaps your boss, and go, oh, Dad, is this the guy that you hate so much? <laughs> That's a little less comfortable, right? And we look at those kids, we expect our 16-year-olds to have a filter. We expect our 16-year-olds to be able to have a process of thinking correctly. We expect our 16-year-olds to be able to look after themselves. We expect our 16-year-olds to have some kind of maturity. When, when they don't get what they want, we don't expect them to throw their temper tantrum. When you've got a small child, and you've got, let's say you've got, you've got siblings in the home, uh, you, you pour a, 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 a glass of cool drink for one of them, and the other one of them is just like a millimeter or two fuller than the other one. There's a nightmare. There's a clash of epic proportion because one child is getting less. Now, that's okay if they're three, and you do want to adjust the behavior, but it's okay if they're three. Here's the challenge. When they are 16... That's a different issue, right? You all agree? Now, we also want our children to be able to feed themselves. When they're two or one, that's okay. Feed them. When they're three or four, you might have to feed them a little bit. You might have to help them to aim more correctly into their mouths. That, you know, that kind of stuff. You might have to guide them and give them a bit of wisdom. But if your 16-year-old goes, Mommy, my chicken isn't cut up into pieces, there's a bit of a problem. They need to feed themselves. Now, granted, I don't know whether any of you have ever had a teenage boy in your home. Um, feeding themselves isn't a problem. It's not a problem. In fact, in fact, for most teenage boys, the fridge is a transitional moment. It's a transitional moment. So if they are in their bedroom and they need to walk north to their sister's room, they will rather go east to go to the transitional facility, which is the fridge. If they're outside and they're coming inside, they pass by the fridge. If we're going out, fridge. Brush your teeth, fridge. Before brushing teeth, fridge. After teeth, bread, bed, fridge. Everything is about a fridge. Because a teenage boy can only ever think about food. Oh, and other stuff, we'll talk about that another time. Fridge. <laughs> they think about food. And, 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 and they feed themselves. Here's the issue. Listen, there's a strong parallel, a massive parallel, spiritually. And so often, we live our spiritual lives like immature children. We want other people to feed us. We throw our temper tantrum when we don't get what we want. 
We complain and criti we criticize, we mock and, con and, and condemn, and we're often so infatuated with our own self-worth and our own comfort that we actually don't ever mature. You see, the problem with maturity is that it doesn't come with tenure. You know, we've used this for years. People have said, the older you get, the wiser you get. Ooh, we all know that's not true. We all know that's not true. The older you get, the older you get. The older you get, the more back pain you find. The older you get, the harder it is to lose weight. But the older you get doesn't mean you get wiser. In fact, we all know of teenagers who are more wise than many adults we know. You see, maturity isn't about tenure. Maturity is a choice. And when we're looking at spiritual growth, we need to be aware of that. There's a strong parallel between how we live as children and how we live spiritually. And here's a couple of things. Maybe we need to be reviewing our lives. Is that okay? This, this message is going to be a little tough, but I'm really there to help you. I really hope today that this will, this will open up your mind and open ourselves up for, for more growth spiritually. Look at this. Have you ever thought for a moment, just for a moment, have you ever thought about this about yourself? When someone is new to, to, to following Christ, there are some immaturities that remain for a while. Here's one of them. Uh, we, 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 are, we have limited understanding of God's word, and we hear more than we apply. Isn't that true? We hear more than we apply. We, we listen to the word of God, but we don't always apply it. We read the word sometimes, and we don't apply it. We hear more than we apply it. Same with small children. Children hear a lot more than they apply. Remember that? Children, when they're little, small children, hear more than they apply. We know this to be true, because when kids are, 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 are speechless, when they're, they're unable to speak yet... We speak to them a great deal more than they speak back. Then all of a sudden, they start to, to build a vocabulary, a vocabulary, and they start to speak, and they start to talk, because they're starting to outwork. They're starting to apply what they've been hearing. We talk about manners. As parents, we spend an awful lot of time, hopefully, trying to entrench manners into our children. And, 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 and even then, it's like you look at your kids, and you're going, I'm sure we've discussed this 4,000 times this morning. And eventually I start applying. It's a process of growth. It's a process of maturity. But we do that spiritually. We, we hear the word of God. We listen to the word of God a lot more than we apply it. But here's the second thing. We hang on to past thoughts and ideas and actions while still hoping to move forward. It, it's kind of like this. We, we, we really like to be here. We know that smoking weed is perhaps not the best thing in the world to do. It makes you feel good. But, but it makes us hungry. Makes us our, our eyes quite dry. Not that I have any experience with this at all. My wife is laughing. That's not funny. So we, we like weed, but we want to move forward. We, we, we want to sleep with everyone in a skirt because women are so attractive. And we know we, we like, I need to be, but I, 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 I want to stay here, but I also want to move forward. So we get stuck in the past, we want to do what we've always done, we don't want to change much, but we do also kind of want to move forward. As we're new to following Christ, we, we, we want comfort and convenience and pleasure. We want the pleasure more than we want the growth. Maybe, maybe this morning you're watching the service in, in, in bed. Clever, that's good, because you're in the comfort of your duvet maybe. You're looking at watching us on Facebook, wondering why Facebook is translating my words incorrectly. Like, I don't know what Facebook has said that to be. Take a screenshot, send it to us. Listen, listen, listen. We get stuck, right? We're comfortable in our bed, and, and it's amazing to, to, to not have to give. Or we don't have to get up early to come to church and find parking, and we, we certainly don't have to, to get up early and, and be briefed at 7 or 6.30 uh, as, as we serve today. It's just so much more, more comfortable in bed, and it's amazing to be watching the service, and I can just reach over and drink my coffee because at Bridge, they don't let you bring your coffee into the auditorium. What kind of church does that? But I can have my, church, my coffee right now in my church, and it's amazing. I can watch in my jammies. And it's so great to be an immature Christian. Because you see, the reality is we're more interested in comfort and convenience when we start out as followers of Christ than we are in the cause. Now, the, if you've been a follower of Christ for a couple of days or a couple of months, well, that's fine. But what happens if you've been a follower of Christ for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? 
We think of ourselves more than others when we start out as followers of Christ. We, we like to, to, to think of our own interests and what matters to us, and being generous is incredibly difficult. When we start out as followers of Christ, we're super critical. We criticize more than we compliment. We're easily influenced by the loudest voices around us because, hey, we're tossed around. We're not quite sure where we stand. And that's all okay if you're starting out as a, as a beginner Christian, as you're learning out what this means, if you've just learned who Jesus is and you've just started to develop this relationship with him. But when you've been a follower of Christ two, three, four, 10, 15, 20 years, this is a problem. And you and I need to recognize that if we want to step into any kind of growth, we need to be willing to change the way we live. Maybe we should look at those things. Let's recap it. We need to look at the fact, do we understand or do we uh, hear God's word more than we apply it? Do we have a limited understanding of his word? How do you have a limited understanding of his word? Well, if you never read it, you'll never know it. Do we hang on to past thoughts and actions and try to bring them with us? Are we more interested in comfort and convenience and pleasure? Are we more interested in ourselves than others? And are we super critical and easy, easily influenced by others? If we are, there's a maturity issue. Now, that's fine if you're two. But if you're 15 or 20 or 30 or followers of Christ for any length of time, that needs to change. And this list will be prevalent in anyone who is new to following Christ or is spiritually immature. And here's the problem. Spiritual maturity will come up on the screen. Don't forget this. Spiritual maturity has nothing to do with tenure and everything to do with Christ-likeness. In other words, the more like Christ we become, the more mature we become because Christ was not immature. So if you and I want to become more spiritually mature, it's not about how much of the Bible we know. You can have a PhD in theology that does not make you mature. All it makes you is clever. The reality is getting a lot of knowledge makes you good at retaining knowledge. It does not make us spiritually mature. Spiritual maturity has nothing to do with tenure, nothing to do with education, and everything to do with Christ-likeness. Yep. So can I encourage you to join me today as we walk the pathway to maturity. Walking the pathway to maturity is the title of today's session. I want to encourage us to walk on this journey because there's a couple of things that we can learn so that we can be more effective. You okay with that? Let's go on the journey. You being helped? Come on, be nice and responsive. Being helped? So the reality is we're going to tuck into Ephesians 4 again. Paul writing to the developing church. This is going to be a chunk of scripture we're going to read, perhaps more than you've read for a while. But I do want to encourage you to open up your hearts and receive what God has for us, because this is really helpful in helping us to develop some spiritual maturity. Reading from verse 11. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave the church. These are the gifts Christ gave the church. These are the gifts Christ gave the church. I'm repeating that because it's an important place to start. If you and I are going to walk into maturity, we need to understand this. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, they are the gifts that God has given the church. In other words, a spiritual gift, but also a person. A a person who's called by God into that role in order to add value to our spiritual maturity. Their responsibility, in other words, The apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, their responsibility is to equip, look at this, equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Their job is to equip God's people. So in other words, my job is not to do the work, my job is to get you to do the work. (laughs) It's not my job to read the word of God for you. It's not my job to pray for you. It's not my job to be nice to others for you. It's not my job to resolve conflict for you. It's not my job to to look after your wife for you. Look after your husband for you. Look after your children for you. It's not my job. My job is to equip you to do that well. My job, the full-time staff job, anyone in full-time ministry, is there to equip God's people to do His work. In other words, each and every one of us needs to be going on a journey of learning from our spiritual leaders so that we can be better equipped at doing God's work. What is God's work? Building up the church. Wouldn't it be amazing if if, if churches around the planet stopped fighting with one another and just started loving one another? Wouldn't it be amazing if every single one of us in this room were significantly less interested in the color of our skins? Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't it be amazing if we just loved people because they breathe? 
We don't have to agree with them. We don't have to like them. We don't even have to have anything in common, but we love them because God tells us to. Wouldn't it be amazing if you and I worked together, irrespective of what happens around us? Wouldn't it be amazing if you and I just decided to build the church, the body of Christ? Verse 13, this will continue when we have all come to such unity and faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be, say it with me, we'll be, mature in the Lord, measuring up to the complete and full standard of Christ. In other words, you and I will have to carry on with that journey, the, the full-time leadership of, of, of a full-time ministry leadership in your churches, in your communities, will carry on. Those five different gifts will continue to flow in the church until everyone on the planet is so mature, so unified, that we become more like Christ. Verse 14, then no, we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by social media and every new idea or wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when celebrities and YouTube influencers try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. We'll care for people growing up in every way to be more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together, not fight all the time, fit together purpose, uh, perfectly. Each part does his own special work. It helps the other part grow, not break it down, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love, not hate. Now, you see, I added a whole lot of stuff. Don't write me letters. I was trying to bring it to reality. Listen, get, let's get our hearts in the right place. Are you okay today? Let's put ourselves in a position where we are trying to be more like Christ. Let's go back to this answer. Where if you look for the answers in the wrong place, you'll have the wrong solutions. Apply those wrong solutions, and there'll be more pain. You get either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. We need to go forward and make a difference to others. So there are a couple of things today that we need to realize. Hopefully we'll get through two or three of them before our time is up. A couple of thoughts that we need to recognize if you and I are going to walk on the pathway to maturity. Here's the first. Taking notes, should be taking notes, mature people take notes. Here's the first one. Our church leaders equip us to equip themselves. They equip us to equip themselves. As God's people, as followers of Christ, it's our personal responsibility to act and behave and live our lives in line with God's word. Here's the challenge. If we're not reading God's word, how on earth are we going to know what it says? Stop relying on humanity to help you. Start digging in to what God calls you to do. If you read the word of God every day, you may not fully understand the whole chapter. You may not fully understand the context. But as you read, more and more knowledge will, will uh, settle in your heart. That's called revelation. Pastor Andrew spoke about it earlier. Let's get our hearts in the right place. Because you see, we have to press in to God for ourselves. So often... Most churches around the planet, this is true of every church on the, in the world, the vast majority of the people in that church only hear or read the Word of God on a Sunday when someone in full-time ministry reads it to them. I genuinely hope that's not the case in our church, but I would be naive to believe it's any different. In other words, mom and dad are still feeding you. Mommy and daddy are still cutting up your chicken so that you can chew it. If you want to start stepping into spiritual maturity, you need to delve into the Word of God yourself. Feed yourself. You cannot, you cannot live a, a week on a breakfast at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. We have to learn to pray. When we're working with small children, we teach them how to communicate with adults. I think there's a society that's shifting where we start to see kids, small kids talking to adults by their first name. Now, I'm old school here. I think that's horrendously rude. I think you should be teaching your kids to use uncle or aunt, and yes, they think they've got the biggest family on the planet, but I do think you should be teaching your kids to, to show respect. And it freaks my noodle when I have a four-year-old going, hey, Trev, I'm like, because we teach our kids manners, don't we? Now, when we, as, as, as full-time ministry, we want to teach you to pray, how to talk to God, have a conversation with God with respect. We have to be disciplined in what we watch and what we see and what we act and, and how we act and what we do. We need to be disciplined. You can't apply God's word unless you know God's word. Here's another one. You need to be willing to be inconvenienced for the work of reaching others and serving them. Because children are so self-centered. I love watching families when a new sibling is born, particularly if the, old, if the, the, the first child's kind of two or three. And they love it. I love watching it because the older child is so, so doting and protective and loving over their new baby brother or baby sister in the world until that baby brother touches their toys. <laughs> That's why there are so many younger children with Lego imprints on their head. 
Because not, that, that older child is not being inconvenienced yet. But when my toys are taken, they were my toys. Mommy gave them to me. Now you take them. I will beat you with that Lego. <laughs> right? It's immature. But don't we behave a little bit like that as we grow older? Well, you know, I've worked a long week getting up early on a Sunday to serve Jesus. Don't they recognize that I have a life? I told you the message would be a little bit tough, eh? I want to encourage you. Listen, spiritual maturity requires us to go to the next level. You being helped? So we need to keep our hearts there. Never forget it. The full-time ministry team, all of the leaders in the church are there to equip us to do the work. It's not their responsibility. It's ours. And each and every one of us need to step into that. You being helped? Number twice. Number two. As followers of Christ, it's our job to build up the church. This is so important. This is so important. Look at Paul's words. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Full-time team, equip us to do the work. That's what the four core values of our church are all about. Our four core values are not about uh, the full-time team nurturing and caring as much as they are mobilizing people to get going. Now, this is for clarity. Do we, as a church leadership, nurture and care for people in our church? Of course we do. That's vital because we want to love others as we love ourselves. But I am more interested in mobilizing the church to be effective than rocking it with everybody in the fetal position in front of a nice, cozy, warm fire under a duvet. Our job is not to make you feel good about yourself. Our job is to equip you so that you will feel good about yourself because you're adding value. It's the idea that you and I need to get going and do something of value. That's why we don't put our arms around you going, oh, I'm so sorry that you feel a little tired on a Sunday morning. Oh, no, you don't have to stay under the duvet. You don't have to come to, oh, no shame, just... Just stand at the duvet. Don't, don't have to serve today because you're tired. Now, where do we go? Suck it up. Our team will find you if you don't pitch. Where are you? If we can't get hold of you, go, where were you? Are you okay? Are you alive? Yep. Now, why weren't you here? You made a commitment. And you go, that's hectic. Why would a church be like that? Well, because that's what parents do when children are immature. Because you see, if your kids wake up in the morning and go, Mommy, I just... You know, I just slept on my left side all night. My ears are a little tired. I don't want to go to school. <laughs> You'd go, suck it up. Get out of bed, put your school uniform on, and go to school. Right? Yeah. Why is it? Why, why do we think that's okay, but being developed for God's kingdom, the most important role, the most important job on the planet, it's okay to be sloppy and lazy and immature? It's not. They're like, I'm never watching this church again. <laughs> We'll miss you, but when you mature up, come back. Are you all okay? Because here's the challenge. Here's the challenge, South Africans. Every single one of us, if you're watching online, we are too complacent and too comfortable. We need to do something that, 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 that is about maturity. We need to stand up. Why are there so many fathers that bail out in South Africa on their families? Immaturity. Why is there so much violence at home? Immaturity. Why is there so much alcoholism and, and, and unnecessary drinking? Immaturity. Why is there so much greed and poverty in our nation? Immaturity. Why does our government pillage us? Immaturity. Yeah. Now you might go, that's a, that's a political statement. No, it's not. It's just a fact of immaturity. If, I, if, I, if the leaders in government, no matter where they are in our country, anywhere else in the world, are more interested in lining their own pockets than, than adding value to the nation, it's immature. It's selfish. So it's time that we change. When we are more interested in the color of our skin than in someone else's, we're immature. We need to not see color. Come on. We need to love everyone because God breathed life into humanity. There are hindrances to maturity. Did you know that? There are hindrances to, to unity and there are hindrances to, to maturity. And these are the things that we look for in our own children. This is not new. This is not clever. I wish I was clever enough to, to, to suck, suck this out of thin air. This is not the case. Every one of us as parents, every one of us knows these things. But just in case we've forgotten, I want to remind us of a couple of them that are, that are hindrances to maturity. The first is offense. The first is offense. Not the fence, offense. Easily offended people are immature. What, what, what causes us to be offended? If you're offended by anything I've said online, it's because you're immature. Grow up. Allow God to do something. Strengthen yourself. We cannot be immature. And if we're offended, it's because we're immature. Someone corrects you. We flip our noodle. Isn't that what happens when we tell a little two-year-old? You cannot touch that. But I want to touch it. 
No, you can't bring coffee into the church. <laughs> Please, would you park here? <laughs> What makes you offended? What makes you offended? You see, if we're offended, we're immature. We've had people in our church who've done things, unwise things, so we've said to them, that was a little unwise. And this is why it's unwise. It's not good for you. It's not good for what you're doing. Then they get offended and step out of ministry for a while. My message to you is grow up. What makes you offended? Because if you're easily offended, it means you haven't got a strong enough spiritual life to carry you through correction. And correction is what shapes us. The, the Word of God, the user manual for life, tells us that God disciplines those He loves. Yeah. Arrogance is another one. Arrogance, oh my word, lack of humility is immature. Thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to. Listen, we must be careful of arrogance. Aren't we seeing this around the world today? Celebrities who make millions acting in a movie suddenly have a view on abortion and politics and climate change and cats and olives and all of a sudden they have a view of everything and we are enamored by them. So we watch them online and on Twitter and Facebook and Face Twitter and all the other options and we look at them and we go, oh, look, at that. they are so amazing. Oh, they acted in an, an Oscar winning movie that makes them authority on everything. No, man. Making millions out of a movie makes you no more valuable than anyone else on the planet. Make, making millions in a movie makes you nothing more than a great actor. We need to be careful that we don't let the arrogance of social media shape the way we think. Look for answers in the right place. How about greed? Being unwilling to invest our time, talent, and treasure into the things of, of, of value around us. If you're in politics today, your political responsibility is to invest in the nation, the people of this nation, not your own pocket. And if you and I run a business, the, job, the opportunity that we have is to invest our time, talents, and resources into building that organization so that there's job creation and that there is hope in this nation to lift people's lives. If you breathe and you're a follower of Christ, it's your responsibility to invest into God's kingdom so that more and more people can get to know the love of Jesus Christ. That is our mandate. And if you find it difficult to be, to, to be generous, it's because you're immature. To business people, can I just draw your attention to this? Anyone, any business person, listen. If you feel that the only way that you will tithe 10% of your gross income, which is what tithing is all about, is if you can get a Section 18A tax certificate you're immature. The Word of God does in no way indicate, does no way indicate that we should be giving 10%, tithing in other words, for our own benefit. God's life manual, user manual for life, all through Scripture teaches us that we should bring 10% of our gross income into the kingdom of God, the storehouse, our spiritual food source. That's where we bring it. That's tithing. If you're giving to a foundation, to SPCCA, which is a wonderful organization, and all of the other organizations, the various foundations and nonprofits, if you're giving to those, and you think that's tithing, you're sorely mistaken. Because you see, the reality is tithing, tithing is tithed with no expectation of anything in return. And if you need your tax break, it's not tithing. And you might be offended with that. Well, let's go back to the offense point. <laughs> Selfishness. Come on. Selfishness prevents us from being mature. It's being unwilling to serve. It's being unwilling to put others above ourselves. How about entitlement? Oh, my word, entitlement. Yeah. My pet peeve. Entitlement is believing that we deserve something based on race or gender or education or age or, or, or intellect. Can I just draw our attention to this one thought? Entitlement is a massive, massive indictment on you and me. You know, the Word of God teaches us that if you do not work, you do not eat. We don't deserve anything. We work for it. Can I just encourage us as South Africans, no matter where you find yourself, don't be entitled. Well, I'm a woman, therefore I'm entitled to. I'm, I'm a millennial, I'm entitled to. I'm a boomer, I'm entitled to. I'm the, the, the leader of this business, therefore I'm entitled to. 
I'm a, I'm a politician, I'm entitled to. I'm black, I'm entitled to. I'm, I'm Indian, I'm entitled to. I'm colored, I'm entitled to. I'm white, I'm entitled to. No, 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 no. Let's put ourselves back. Let's look at the right place for the right answers. None of us are entitled to anything. If we aren't all in, if we're not willing to commit ourselves to the work of Jesus Christ, if we are not committed to growth spiritually, we will always remain an infant. We'll always remain an infant. Look at this. Verse 13. This will continue. In other words, the process of maturing. This will continue until we come into such unity in in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now, of course, this applies to spiritual life, but it applies to your workplace, to your family, to any organization. Because maturity is about sacrifice, isn't it? Isn't it maturity about sacrifice? If you play golf, gentlemen, ladies, you work all week and then you take every Saturday to play a round of golf. That's immature. You've got a family. You've got a family, invest in them. I'm not anti-golf, I play golf, I'm just bad at it. But can I encourage you? Now that could be golf, it could be tennis, it could be hiking, it could be cycling, anything. When you and I put our own interests over the well-being of others, we haven't yet become mature. Here's a thought, write down. Working in unity is maturity. So we need to remove the I and me and everything that we do and replace it with the us and we. If you're in the habit in your business of saying, I look after a team of people, therefore it's my staff, or if you run a parts division in an organization and you say, I have the following spares, can I encourage you to change the way you speak? Because you didn't start the business, did you? You didn't fund and pay for the, the stock. It's not your stock. It's the business's stock. So let's rephrase things. Let's not, look, you, let's not use I and me. You can say our staff. This is our team. We have a great staff compliment. It's a great team. Good language. You might go, it's semantics. No, it's not, because everything about you says something about you. When, you. when you run a parts division, someone says to you, have you got this part? You go, no, we don't have that part. Not I don't have it. You never paid for it. You never, paid, you never sacrificed your home to raise enough money to make it happen. You're part of a team. It's not I and me. It's us and we. This is our church. I get massively frustrated when people go, oh, I love your church. It's not my church. It never has been. It's God's church. But rather say this, I love our church because it's ours. We are the body of Christ. Online, our church. At home, our church. Our nation. So when you're more interested in the big picture and serving others, everything changes. Why? Because that's what maturity is. Imagine what could change if we could just apply this. Verse 14. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Imagine what could change, not only in your business and in your home, but across this nation, if we were just willing to be mature. Wouldn't that be great? So can I encourage you today as we draw to a close and we start praying, that we put aside the me and the I and look at how we can serve Jesus with all of ourselves. Because there's something very special, something very unique about committing ourselves to the work of Jesus. So come, bow your heads. In the room, bow your heads. If you're watching at home, I want to talk to you for just a moment. If you want to start this journey, this walking on the pathway towards maturity, you need to connect with Jesus. Why? Because he's the greatest tour guide you'll ever have. Jesus never once fell short of God's standards. Jesus never missed the mark. And if you and I are willing for just a moment to open up our hearts and receive all that Jesus has, we will start to become more mature. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. He also said this, he who believes has everlasting life. What does he want us to know? Well, this incredible Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, unified as one. Different roles, different personalities, different mission in life, but all together, one purpose. God the Son 
Jesus Christ lived on this planet for 33 years, never once fell short of God's standards. Perfect in every way. He allowed his own creation to brutally beat him and nail him to a cross. And yet, after he died, three days later, God raised him from the dead, death, raised him from the grave through the power of the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead so that you and I can recognize that we too can be elevated out of immaturity, elevated out of aloneness, elevated out of the brokenness of the, life, of the, of the world we, we live in and live for something bigger than ourselves. So all across the channels that you're watching on and across this room, if you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to make that clear, that invitation very clear. You have an opportunity to start walking on this pathway to maturity by simply inviting Jesus into your life. How? Well, Jesus said, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock and he who hears and opens the door and invites me in, I'll dine with him and he with me. Jesus is inviting you today to make a very big call in your life. Why don't you make that decision? While your heads are bowed, no one looking around, all the, everyone at home. Well, if you would like to make that decision in this room right now, quickly shoot your hand up. Shoot your hand up and say, yes, I want Jesus in my life. At home, why don't you make a decision to let us know? 082-736-9668. Let us know that you would like to make that decision. Then pray with me right now. Everyone in the room, everyone at home, pray this, these words. I'll pray the words. All you need to do is pray them with, you, with me and you'll be taking that walk. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Please come into my life. I'm sorry for my sins. But from this day forward, I want to walk the path to maturity and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God a huge hand. That's amazing. All at home, well done if you've made that decision. Let us know. Let us know you've made that decision by texting us on our WhatsApp line, 082-736-9668. Uh, we'll let you know what happens next. We'll take you on a journey. If you're in the auditorium right now, click on the QR code, scan it, say I made, a follow, uh, I made a decision to follow Jesus. We'll take you on that journey with us as well. And don't forget, next week, you don't want to miss out. We're going to carry on with the series. It's going to be spectacular. And uh, today we're going to be um, dedicating some children today, which is really exciting, and baptizing people today. So online, we, you won't get to see it today, but everyone in the auditorium will. So God bless you. We'll see you next time online.